everyone. And let me first wish you in France and in Europe a Happy New Year 2021. Welcome to our annual economic outlook, which will be dedicated to the future of Europe in light with the most recent economic developments, but more importantly, in light with the decisions taken by the European leaders during the pandemic and the outcome of the US elections. As we all know, the challenges we are facing today are the consequences of unprecedented adverse events we have been through over the past decade. And while we were skeptical on their capacity to act, we have also been surprised by actions taken by policymakers. The openness to assess long term challenges inherited from structural weaknesses, the willingness to design non orthodox and creative solutions, and against all bets, the capacity to reach political consensus and to implement decisive changes to fix step by step the deficiencies of the European Union. However, as we look at the reform agenda over the past years, we must recognize that progress falls short of expectations. Last year was not different from the prior episodes. While political leaders decided on the first steps to a common fiscal setup, it looks like the initiative which requires much more additional political capital to succeed as a permanent solution. To say it simply, Europe is one more time at the crossroad. To enlighten us on the future of Europe, I am pleased to welcome Jean-Claude Trichet to this very special economic outlook. Jean-Claude Trichet has led central banking during two decades of this transformational period for monetary policy. First, as governor of Banque de France between 1993 and 2003, Jean-Claude you were one of the fathers of the creation and the implementation of the euro currency. And from 2003 up to 2011, as president of the European Central Bank, you were at the front line of the great financial crisis and the European sovereign crisis. During these turbulent times, ECB introduced not only unconventional monetary policy, but it did accelerate the banking union and articulated many creative solutions to avoid the dislocation of the monetary union. When Christine Lagarde took over as president of ECB last October 2019, you wrote, where they see only negatives, I see success, continuity, unprecedented challenges, and a question about the limitations of monetary policy. We couldn't have a better timing to have you with us today. This event has been prepared in partnership with CFA Institute and the newly created Macroeconomics Series Committee, launched by Sarah Carlson, Senior Vice President in the Sovereign Risk Group at Moody's, and Tristan Perrier, Economist at Amundi. I'm pleased to leave the mic to Sarah, who will conduct the discussion. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jean-Philippe. And first of all, let me just welcome everyone tonight who's joining. Um, and let me offer a special welcome to uh, fellow CFA societies from around Europe 
We're talking tonight with a truly great European to hear his insights, and we thought that what better opportunity to actually make this a pan-European CFA Society event. So to those of you joining us from outside of France, bienvenue. But on to the main event. So Jean-Claude Trichet, you were at the helm of the ECB during the last crisis that we experienced. This has been less than 15 years ago. When you think about the current juncture that we're at, when you reflect upon your experience, what are two lessons that have been learned particularly well? And conversely, what are a couple lessons that appear to have not been learned as well as we might have hoped? Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for this, uh, for this question that are so so pertinent, if I may. Let me also uh, say Happy New Year to, uh, to you, to Jean-Philippe, and uh, to all uh, those who are uh, online at the moment I'm speaking. So, to respond to your first question, I would say first lesson, which is uh, uh, very, very important. Beware of economic and financial mainstream fashion. I will never forget, of course, that before the subprime crisis, before the Lehman Brother explosion, we were, we had a mainstream which was really thinking that we were in a world of uh, calm and tranquility, great moderation, uh, uh, admirable efficiency of financial markets in all circumstances, and so on and so on. This was really the, uh, I would say, mainstream analysis at the time. Of course, you had elements that were worrying. Of course, you had a number of Cassandras that were saying, no, 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 it's more, much more complicated. The lesson is it's always complicated. We have always to trust that, uh, I would say, risk analysis, very serious risk analysis is necessary in all circumstances. And again, let's be aware of fashion in that domain as well as in many others. Second extent, we had been laxist on prudentials. All prudentials, all financial prudentials, particularly, I would say, banks' prudentials, and uh, that was clearly a major lesson. Uh, the consequence of uh, the crystallization of this analysis that we, we had uh, not right in analyzing the prudentials was that we uh, created, we reinforced the Basel Committee, we reinforced the uh, G20 meditation on prudentials, we had the, the uh, creation or reinforcement of the uh, uh, stability uh, global Council, if I may, uh, and uh, again, potentials, banking potentials have been formidably uh, improved. I would not say that all potentials were formidably improved, unfortunately, and particularly in the non-banks. We have still a very, uh, I would say, important uh, hard work to do. Uh, in, in particularly in that domain, and more generally in all the domains where you could see clearly in the financial sphere elements of pro-cyclicality, which are still there in many domains, including, if I may, uh, Sarah in the rating agencies constituency. I mean, it's a, it's a major issue which has uh, still to be to be looked at. But you you asked me two, I will say three lessons, of course. Uh, already mentioned a little bit by Jean-Philippe, we had in Europe a major lesson. We had to improve considerably, not only in the present pandemic crisis, but in the crisis you are referring to, namely the Lehman Brothers, uh, and uh, of course also the sovereign risk crisis in Europe. So the main lessons were, were well, we had to improve formidably resilience resilience at national levels. I had myself to uh, deal with the Greek problem, the Irish problem, the Portugal problem in 2010, the Spanish problem, the Italian problem in 2011, with major, major intervention on the secondary market of treasuries in order to counter the uh, speculation and to avoid 
an absolute catastrophe on five major countries, uh, member of the European Union, uh, which re were representing with Spain and Italy approximately 37, 38% of the GDP of the euro area. So we, we had really a major, major systemic crisis. And of course, at that time, major lesson, and that will be my last word on this first part of your question, banking union was created, the European stability mechanism was created, the macroeconomic imbalance procedure was created, the semester, the European semester was created. So uh, a formidable reinforcement, if I may, of the cohesion of uh, the euro area. Uh, of course, it's not over. Of course, we have a lot of things to be done and some were done in the recent pandemic crisis, but it proves, and Jean-Philippe said that already, and I know Sarah from our previous conversation that it is also a point that uh, you are sharing, uh, Europe was able to resist the difficulty much, uh, I would say, more than was suspected by many. And uh, only to conclude on that, we had, after Lehman Brothers, and during the crisis period, new countries joining in, four new countries joined the euro area after Lehman Brothers. The three Baltic states and Slovakia. So it means something in terms of resilience and capacity to address to to take immediate situation. Now, as regards the lessons which were not too, <laughs> too well, major one is the following. We knew at the moment of Lehman Brothers that the accumulated outstanding, the over leveraging of the economy, of the global economy and the advanced economies had been a major, major cause, not the only one by far, but a major cause for the difficulty. That did not prevent the global economy, the advanced economies as a particular vulnerable constituency to continue to pile up debt uh, since uh, uh, 2008, 2009, up to now, up to pre-pandemic level, if I may. And that is something which uh, I take it as uh, uh, very grave because uh, we knew that uh, over indebtedness was a major cause for vulnerability and we continued and that what i'm speaking is is not of europe particularly not of the advanced economy only it's at a global level at a global level it is exactly what we had observed a second point uh, which is also important in my eyes is that we did as i said already a lot of good job as regards the banks and uh, all the prudentials that are uh, that we are concentrating on the banks, the rest of the financial sphere is was largely out of the reach of the G20 of the international community, and all the sphere of the non-banks is still, in my opinion, to be examined very very carefully in order to avoid an accumulation out an accumulation of risks out of the bank's uh, stricto sensu. And this would be my two main points. The last one, but it's always, as I said, beware of fashion. I see now a new illusion according to which everything will go very smoothly in the advanced economy because you can finance debt and public debt in particular, but also private debt, without any difficulty. We have uh, zero interest rates. We have a very nice situation. The central banks are purchasing very nicely all the treasuries. And so there is absolutely no problem. And it should go forever, by the way. We are sure are uh, saying some of the observers and analysts, certainly not the CFA, <laughs> In my members, in my opinion, but many nevertheless are suggesting that we are in the best of the world forever. This is, of course, incredibly naive. And I stop there. 
Well, we're going to come back to that, that, that last point later on, because I think that's actually incredibly important uh, for, for the conjuncture over the next you know, five, seven years. But uh, to, to back up, just thinking about the real economy, how are you thinking about the shape of the economic recovery, but more importantly, thinking about longer term, European governments, governments around the world have really spent large sums of money trying to reduce the permanent damage caused by the pandemic. How much scarring do you expect to see in the advanced economies, for example? Well, f first of all, of course, the, the pandemic uh, was a terrible shock coming uh, on, uh, I would say, global economies, advanced economies that were already vulnerable, uh, all, both, I would say, economically and uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, let's not forget that before the pandemic, uh, a large number of economists were expecting a recession in the United States because of the fact that we had already had, during uh, more than 10 years, uh, a long-term growth, uh, by the way, the longest since World War II. So that, that, that was one, I mean, there, there was some vulnerability at the level of the real economy in the advanced economy in general, and by way of consequence, of course, in the, the global economy. And uh, the financial sphere, uh, before the pandemic, uh, numerous were the analysts that were uh, thinking that uh, the uh, valuation of stocks and shares in the advanced economy in the US, but also in the advanced economy in general, were very high. So overvaluation of a number of uh, uh, asset classes plus uh, vulnerability in the real economy. And it is on top of that that the pandemic comes and introduces a dramatic exogenous uh, uh, catastrophe uh, hurting and hitting both supply and demand in a very violent uh, uh, way. I would say when we said uh, that uh, we probably had the worst crisis since uh, 29 of the uh, previous century, it was absolutely true. And to such exceptional dramatic circumstances, the response of the governments and of the central banks were equally dramatic and uh, uh, incredibly bold obviously. So in this uh, situation, I would say that uh, uh, we could avoid the equivalent of the depression of, uh, of 29, but we had a, a dramatic recession. When I look at the situation at the global level, uh, the, the I, IMF says that uh, we have probably minus 4.4% of recession at a global level, which is really incredibly tough. And uh, for the uh, for the US, it's minus 4.3. We will see exactly what happens when we have all the accounts. In the euro area, minus 8.3. So it's, it's really tough. If I take my own country, uh, we, were, we have a recession which was three times bigger than what we had in the Lehman Brothers in 2009. Uh, in so, so it's very, very tough. Uh, but, but, because there was a mobilization of the central banks, which was incredible, and of the governments, which was equally incredible, we could avoid a, a social drama, uh, the, uh, I would say, uh, unemployment skyrocketing, and so forth. So there was difference between countries. But the, one of the uh, remarks that I would make there is that I'm speaking of the advanced economy. We have also the, uh, I would say, vulnerable economies. We have the developing economies. We have a lot of economies. I put China apart, but we were very badly hit and had not the same way of protecting themselves by uh, public spendings and central banks uh, mobilization. So we, we should never forget the situation of the rest of the world and uh, the vulnerability of the rest of the world, inequality at, the, at that global level, we are very sensitive and we are right to do so to the inequalities inside the advanced economy, inside our own economies. But uh, it is also absolutely dramatic at the global level. All that being said, I expect that uh, we will get out of the uh, pandemic probably uh, depending on the countries, on the continents in some respect, uh, mid-2022 uh, or at the end of 22. 
that depends on, on uh, uh, I would say, mainly on what we will do. And I would say we, I mean we, the economic agents, we, the households, we, the entrepreneurs, we, all those elements, because uh, our economies are made of uh, convergence, of will investments, of uh, paving the way for the future. And that, that is essential. But all taken into account, really, I am very saddened to see that, uh, uh, I would say, end of 22, we will probably, in Europe, in the Euro area, arrive at the level we had at the end of 19. I am in the baseline scenario, if I may, of the ECB, and it's more or less the baseline scenario that we have in the international financial institutions. And of course, I don't count all the losses that had been accumulating in 20, 21, and 22. So uh, th this is really a terrible shock. On top of all the vulnerabilities that we had before, and of course, it creates an enormous amount of uh, difficulty to swallow the previous vulnerabilities and to absorb the hump, if I may, of debt outstanding, public and private, which is associated with the pandemic itself. All taken into account, I would say that uh, the advanced economy as a whole will go through all that period with a lot of economic losses. Normally, I would say, uh, most of the household will have big losses to accept, even if we are not very conscious of that at that very moment. And they will all have to be very uh, well managed, if I may, uh, when the pandemic is over. And I hope that the pandemic, of course, is over quite soon. I am still very prudent and cautious, I have to say. I am not spousing the sentiment that we will be totally over after the first semester of this year because of the, of the vaccine. I am not sure of all those variants that are coming. I don't exclude that some variant could be there and could not, uh, be pre pre could not protect us uh, because of the vaccine that had been elaborated on other variants. So I don't want to be too pessimistic, but it seems to me that we have to be very, very cautious and prudent when we are projecting ourselves. But it's not to do nothing of the country. It's to mobilize ourselves even more actively and concentrate on paving the way for the future because the future would be extremely different from the present situation. I see many, many domains of acceleration of underlying trends, uh, economic and financial. And so it seems to me that uh, uh, we have to, to uh, I would say, concentrate all our efforts now on paving the way for the future, not protecting the past. It's easy to say, much more difficult uh, to, to, to do, particularly by uh, governments and, and parliaments, but, but it's common sense. Pave the way for the future, don't concentrate on protecting the past. How are you thinking about uh, the longer term impact on the labor market and unemployment? You've already talked about concerns that we have in advanced economies about inequalities. The pandemic as um, an exacerbate, something that's exacerbated existing inequalities. Is that something that's a particular concern for you once the uh, you know, economies have returned to the level of output that they had before the pandemic existed? Yeah. Uh I see quite a lot of optimism still in the projections as regards the level of unemployment. When I look, for instance, uh, we are in Europe, I, I'm speaking a little bit of the uh, unemployment according to the ECB should be at the, in 21, 8.2 in 22 and 7.5 in 23, namely lower than in year 20, which we have fell of 8%. So the idea is that we, will, we have a deterioration, not a dramatic deterioration. And of course, it's largely due to the money which is spent by the uh, governments and the parliaments on this uh, generalization of the, uh, I would say, financing uh, part-time uh, 
uh, employment or part-time uh, unemployment, as said the French, but all taken into account, it, it is, there is a price, to, a price to be paid for that. But it seems to me a little bit optimistic because I expect major changes in our economies, major reallocation of resources, uh, labor in particular, and that, of course, uh, is uh, not done overnight or even in one or two years. So there we have an enormous and very hard work to do. So be, let's beware also of excess of optimism because it might be apparent, uh, I would say, uh, projection, uh, apparent good projections, but uh, also based upon uh, artificial if I may, uh, legitimate but artificial efforts made by uh, the taxpayers. Uh, that being said, I must confess that we have other issues associated with your questions that are also extremely um, important. Uh, before the pandemic, it was uh, very, uh, I would say, uh, often said that we will have a dramatic unemployment because of the technology, because the new technological revolution mm -hmm. and, and, and. Until now, until pre-pandemic and until now, we did not see that phenomenon. And by the way, we did not see the jump in productivity progress that we are supposed to be associated, of course, with a very large reallocation of resources. Uh, I think that it's only delayed. It's, for me, it's a little bit like uh, the Solo paradox, you know. Uh, Professor Solo was uh, saying, I see a lot of investment in uh, IBM mainframe, but I don't see any consequences in productivity. It's bizarre, it's a paradox. Uh, we have the same paradox. We see incredible technological revolution and not too much not only not too much productivity progress, but stagnation of productivity progress, and uh, which, which, by the way, are part also of the difficulty of uh, the advanced economy from, uh, from the last crisis to the pandemic. So we, we will see exactly where we stand as regards uh, this uh, situation. My expectation is that at a time, as in the time of Professor Solo, we will see the end of the paradox. We, we will see a jump in the productivity progress, and that's good, of course, but also a formidable need of reallocation of labor resources, and of course, a frictional unemployment of a much larger, uh, uh, I would say, dimension. To conclude on that, uh, you mentioned inequalities, I mentioned inequalities. I, I think that the pandemic is accelerating a lot of uh, phenomenon, digitalization, accelerating uh, the, I would say, uh, understanding of why environment is key, understanding why for social cohesion, uh, I would say, taking uh, and combating inequalities is key. And uh, of course, uh, th that, uh, in my opinion, will have a lot of differences uh, in including social protection in the U.S. in particular, in Europe we have already, but it will also, and, that, and we are back to the monetary and economics, it will also probably push wages and salaries up much more, at least in countries which are at full employment, and it would be good for the central banks because they will not have to permanently counter this risk of deflation, which uh, was the main problem since the last crisis and is more or less associated not only with defects in the advanced economy, but also with the fact that uh, the labor bargaining power had formidably diminished uh, since, uh, I would say, uh, the, the last crisis. I stop there. Well, I don't think, I, I don't think we can hold off anymore on talking about inflation and central bank policy because things that we talked about when preparing for this session, also some of the questions we're getting in the chat are all around uh, the interaction between uh, central banks and um, high government debt levels, how, you know, 
the the question arises does high government debt levels uh do that does that even matter given low for longer rates you've expressed a very clear view on that um I think there's also a question to be asked about the volume of QE purchases. And if I can be a bit cheeky, what that means for central bank independence. Uh, if there is this interaction between purchases of government bonds by central banks and the reliance of governments on those purchases to keep rates low. Yeah, well, it's again, <laughs> a very good question, obviously. <laughs> and uh, uh, when, when we look at the uh, level of debt outstanding, uh, particularly securities uh, uh, coming from the government's uh, treasuries. Uh, in the balance sheet of uh, the Central Bank of Japan, the balance sheet of the Central Bank of the US, we probably are now, if I take uh, the, uh, I would say, proportion of what is in the market, what is in the hands of the residents and in the hands of, uh, of uh, I would say, the foreigners, we have now perhaps 45% of the outstanding treasuries, Japanese and US, in the hands of the central bank. In Europe, it's a little less. It's probably has, has to recheck and depends, of course, on the various uh, countries concerned because there are limits, but which are uh, depending on the, their percentage uh, in, in the ECB. But we, we have something like uh, perhaps 25, 25 and more, and it augments, of course taking into account uh, what is in the pipe in the US as well as, uh, as in Europe. Uh, as you know, it is not to please the governments that the central banks are doing that. The central bank uh, in Europe, clearly, we have inflation much too low for a very long period of time. And the materialization of a deflationary risk is not to be neglected. It's very serious. We know by experience how serious it is. So again, the central bank is doing that. And it is, uh, in my opinion, a very wrong interpretation, which is made by some economists to think that all this is combined between government and central bank, at least in Europe, and that this combination is a very nice one where uh, there is some kind of quid pro quo. I take it that if inflation was much higher, you would expect uh, very uh, reasonably the central bank to do something totally different. And, uh, and it seems to me that it's important that uh, everybody has that in mind. Because uh, in my own understanding, we will not be eternally with a situation where uh, productivity progress are very low, uh, uh, real uh, equilibrium interest rates, uh, Vixelion, if I may, interest rates are extremely low. Where the terms is miserable and inflation is very close to the uh, very, very low, abnormally low, also because of the loss of bargaining power of uh, labor. As I said, this will not last forever. Uh, in Japan, full employment before the pandemic. In the US, full employment before the pandemic. In Germany, full employment before the pandemic. In the Netherlands, full employment before the pandemic. Uh, and in Switzerland, and, and, and. And in all those advanced economies, clearly we had unit labor cost, uh, totally miserable in terms of, uh, of uh, nominal progression. And so that, that will not last forever. So we have all to understand that uh, we will have at a time to be in front of central banks having different policies because the situation will be different. Everybody will be satisfied, by the way, if we have inflation back to solid anchoring at 2% over the medium long term uh, and uh, a lot of anomalies that are associated with the present situation will disappear. So those who are saying that will be totally dramatic because the central bank will increase rates or stop, uh, stop the QE and so forth, uh, in my opinion, are also a little bit wrong because they don't incorporate that the, the real economy will be different. The financial economy will be different. We would be in a different universe. The US seems a little bit in advance in terms of going progressively back to a relatively reasonable anchoring 
of inflation expectations in line with the famous 2% in the long run. We will see, we have to be to, to observe the situation with great care. But uh, again, I would warn us against the wrong interpretation that there is an accord between central banks and governments to help the governments or to help the public authorities in general. But de facto, it's true, and, and your question is absolutely right. It's true that it is driving us because it lasted for long. And because on top of that, we have the pandemic, it drives us to a situation which is profoundly abnormal. And the transition to the more normal situation will take time and will not be easy, obviously. Now, what are the kinds of things you could think of that could disanchor inflation expectations to the upside? One of the, the attendees has asked a question in the chat about whether something like a permanently higher spending on social policy could be the source of this disanchoring. Because you're absolutely right. Central banks have been desperate to have more inflation for over a decade. But what about the risks of overshoot? And what are the kinds of catalysts that could cause that disanchoring of inflation and expectations to the upside? Well, so it's, a, it's a good question, and uh, I, I would love to be <laughs> in a situation <laughs> where we would be back to what I have known myself. Uh, fancy that when I was uh, governor, not president of the ECB, I was really proud to say in Berlin, uh, because, you know, there was a lot of fear that inflation would be associated with the euro and so forth. So I was telling in Berlin, look, since the setting up of the euro and during my own term and the term of my predecessor, we arrive at an average inflation of 2%, 1.97%. Uh, and I was on my way to leave. And I was saying, look, it's good. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a real uh, uh, Which was the DM, and the DM had inflation averaged over 40 years before the euro, significant 0.3 percent. So uh, I was very uh, proud of saying we are at the level uh, that we had foreseen as the appropriate one. But from time to time, we were going up, and from time to time, going down. And I have known myself inflation at 4 percent. Uh, headline inflation at 4% at the time of my own mandate. So you see, this was a normal situation where from time to time you have inflation picking up from time to time going down. We are not at all in that situation in Europe and in Japan. I hope very much that as soon as possible, the US will see that, we will see. But on the reasons why, it seems to me that we should not exclude, of course, the uh, inflation picking up, I would not put uh, I would say that uh, it will come out of the laxist policies of the central banks today. I don't think they have laxist policies today. I think it will, it will uh, come, and I, I make the working assumption that as soon as it would be needed for them to be much less accommodating, they would be less accommodating. No, what I think is that it is the real economy which, which is important, the overall productivity progress that, as, as I said, are miserable. They will not be eternally miserable. And they would push the way the real economy up. And that would have certainly a very important effect on, potent, on the underlying inflation. I certainly uh, think that the real interest rates, Wixelian, if I may, equilibrium real interest rates, would go up. They are very, very low today. And of course, it would also push uh, the uh, uh, central banks to be less accommodating. And uh, again, I cannot help mentioning the fact that when you are at full employment, you have to get a uh, push on the wages and salaries because it's normal. It is what is expected in a normal market economy. And uh, again, things are not simplified by the pandemic because we have the scars of the pandemic with uh, higher uh, unemployment. So the overall, I would say, period where we uh, really will be back 
in many economies to full employment is perhaps a little less rapid than I, we would all hope, but it will come. And uh, all taken into account, that's the reason why, I, I, of course, I will not project and tell you in three years' time, uh, I take the rendezvous and so forth. I, we will see, and it depends on the economy. Again, the US is clearly in advance uh, in comparison with, with Europe as regards uh, the going back to a more normal situation. Okay. You've mentioned a, a whole range of risks, both at the beginning, the very first question that I asked, and as we've been talking. But if you were to pick out the two or three most important risks that advanced economies will face over the next five to 10 years that we haven't talked about yet, what would you, what would you pinpoint? First of all, I would say that uh, they are presently uh, stretching to the extreme without the, uh, I would say, combination between central banks or, uh, or a court between central banks and governments, but de facto, they are stretching to the extreme their capacity to borrow as regards the government in Japan, in the Europe, in the US. In the US, much more than we think. I mean, it's a, it's a gigantic effort to borrow. And also, at the same time, we have central banks that are doing extraordinary things and stretching to the maximum their own, I would say, confidence in their currency, in the currency they are issuing. So uh, it is because the US dollar, the Japanese yen, the euro is extremely credible that we could go that given by the central banks to combat an abnormal situation and the risk of deflation I have been mentioning. And it is because the situation is totally dramatic that the governments are uh, stretching on their own credit worthiness. The citizens of uh, the advanced economy, but the citizens uh, and the members and the market participants and the savers in the rest of the world are I would say, not putting into question the credit worthiness of the governments and the credibility of the currency. It is really very impressive to see to which extent the rest of the world, not uh, the emerging countries on the one hand, and all the other countries that I was qualifying as the most vulnerable, are trusting us, we, the advanced economy. And uh, some in the advanced economy are thinking that it is eternal that whatever they do, they will have, and we will continue to have the credit worthiness that we have as regards our signatures and the, uh, I would say, confidence that exists in our currencies. I think it is naive. We will not have the rest of the world permanently accepting what we do, at least when uh, what we would do, and I hope that it won't, never be the case, but we would do would not be reasonable. And that's the reason why I, I draw our attention to some, I would say, bad advices that are given from time to time here and there. That would be my first major risk, that we are stretching too much on our credibility. Now, of course, you have the risk of, uh, I would say, uh, social cohesion, uh, which would dissipate or be dissipated. We, we could see in the US in a way which is uh, very, very impressive how a large part of the population could be, could put into question the system uh, as it is, both I would say uh, social, political and economic. And, and that, that is uh, something, France knows a little bit that with the uh, so-called gilets jaunes which uh, was also a, a little bit of that phenomenon where a, a substantial, significant part of the population feels very uneasy with uh, its economic environment, its uh, social environment, its political environment. And it, I would say in all advanced economy, you have more or less the same phenomenon, very visible uh, in the US, uh, less visible in many other countries, but, but still. And that, that is something to the extent that my theory is that the pandemic accelerates 
formidably, I would say, underlying trends in economy, in our societies, uh, at the global level, as well as at the level of the advanced economy. I think we have to consider that as a major risk, a major risk, uh, social cohesion being the condition for all the rest, of course, in terms of uh, economy, in terms of uh, prosperity. Uh, what could I say? Of course, uh, we have uh, also uh, to reflect not only on the advanced economy as a whole, not only on the uh, global economy itself, but also on particular signature, rich particular economy. Uh, before Lehman Brothers, I have known myself uh, in advanced economies. Now the, the financial markets, private financial markets are financing every uh, country and we don't need the IMF anymore. We don't need anything like a, a system, a public system to help countries in difficulty. It was, of course, incredibly naive. And I had myself uh, to fight, uh, to uh, combat uh, uh, against uh, speculation on Greece, uh, Ireland, Portugal, I say, as I said. So it, it, it is something which I fear also for the future is that uh, we are all in the same basket. We have, have all the pandemic. We are all spending a lot uh, to combat the pandemic. It is right. We are right to do that. But we should not forget that after the pandemic, investors and savers the world over will reassess the quality of all the signatures and will say whether they trust signature A or signature B or signature C. And, and that, of course, inside the advanced economy will create uh, the possibility of having uh, local crisis or uh, local problems or national crisis or national problems. And we, we should not put that aside. Uh, I take it that the advanced economy are more and more uh, treated by investors and savers the world over like the others. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I think that we should not make the working assumption that our credibility is forever, uh, both, I would say, uh, treasuries and, uh, and central banks. But that also means that uh, uh, the rest of the world will not hesitate if there are some Uh, countries and some signature not correctly managed or not correctly uh, protected from uh, from possible difficulties. So, all that being said, as you see, I uh, I remain uh, of, on the optimistic side because I made the working assumption that the real economy will progressively get out of this bad situation, which had been observed over the last ten years or twelve years or whatever, and that we will be uh, in a situation which would be uh, ob objectively much more flattering. I mean, institutions are really part of the bedrock of economic resilience for countries. Is that really the most important institutional challenge that you see at the European or the global level, or are there others that, that you would also highlight? Uh, first of all, we, we are going out of a situation which was very profoundly abnormal, whatever international institutions you have you had the most important country was claiming that uh, they were not participating in the uh, i would say global governance as uh, has been practiced uh, uh, more or less uh, correctly but uh, all taken into account with success since world war ii so we are out of a situation which was really dramatic, frankly speaking. The, the G7 was not functioning. The G20 was not really functioning. Uh, the WHO was not functioning. Uh, the, uh, I mean, all, all glo part and parcels of uh, global governance were out of order because the most important economy was uh, more or less engineering the fact that they would be out of order. So the simple fact that we are back now to a more normal situation, we will see exactly what happens. We will see whether Joe Biden will really uh, be very active in organizing uh, 
uh, we in being back to normal global government I'm optimistic on that on that point but but it doesn't mean that uh, many problems to cope with as regards europe europe for me is a incredibly important historic endeavor that is developing strategic historic endeavor that is developing over the last 70 years because you can trace the start of this uh, endeavor in a certain speech uh, uh, in the year 50 of last century uh, to start the uh, community of uh, cold and steel and it has developed incredibly boldly frankly speaking over the last 70 years and uh, to the extent that it's a historic process it will continue to develop uh, i'm not sure that we will have in europe the equivalent of a hamilton moment as uh, is usually said in the US. We had a lot of Hamilton moment. When we decided to have a European Parliament elected by universal polling, it was incredibly bold. When we invented the single currency, it was incredibly bold. Uh, the, the, I mean, you, of course, the last borrowing of 750 billion euros that was decided and mentioned by Jean-Philippe uh, is also something which is incredibly bold. But you see, we are piling up very bold, uh, I would say, steps in our march towards uh, European Union. Uh, we have proved resilience even in very dramatic circumstances, obviously, at least two very dramatic circumstances over the last uh, 12, uh, 13 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am sure that we will have still a lot of hard work to do, only to give you two examples that I propose myself. I have proposed that we would have a Minister of Economy of the Euro area. I take it that it is not normal that the, the President of the Euro Group is a Minister in one particular country. I take it that what we are doing at the level of the Euro area is sufficiently important to call for a Minister of Economy economy and finance of the euro area and uh, i also trust that uh, to the extent that uh, uh, in our own democracies uh, democratic legitimacy is of extreme importance we should give more i would say cloud to the european parliament when we have very difficult problem to solve uh, and particularly when you have difficulties between one particular country and the European institutions. So you see both reinforcing the executive branch of the Euro area, reinforcing the democratic legitimacy of the decision taken in the Euro area. This will come, in my opinion, <laughs> you have not to be too much in a hurry, of course, it's, it's a historic process. It takes time, it takes time, but, uh, but uh, I am confident. Last question before I, I open it up to, to a couple of the to a few of the questions that we have in the chat. There are a few that are in the same vein. And as a credit analyst, you know, it, it's it's rare that we talk about the upside. But I want to finish. I loved what you were saying about paving the way for the future, not protecting the past. What when you think about the next five, ten years, uh, uh, what are the underappreciated opportunities? Uh, either economic or political that, that you foresee? <laughs> That's a... <laughs> In the present uh, situation where uh, the mood is not that optimistic. No, I, I, first of all, I, am, I have a first education as a, a scientist and engineer. And uh, I have to say that I am a, uh, there is a, a default of many analysis looking at the progress of, of the technological progress and saying they have a lot of defects or a lot of bad consequences. Overall, I am absolutely amazed to see that uh, the vaccine are already there and that we never were able in the past uh, to develop such vaccine in such a short period of time. So it, it is a, an additional proof 
of the capacity that we have techno technologically now in all domains because we concentrate very much uh, on uh, on uh, digitalization and all what we are doing in the IT uh, sector but it's true in all sectors it's true in material science it's true in uh, as we see in health and biology and so I am profoundly optimistic because I see that there we have a lot of good futures that we could pave the way for. By the way, the market know that. When you look at what they are doing to finance those startups, the two vaccines that are already operational are were developed by two startups. The big the big firms back them, but the ingenium, the uh, the uh, inventions, the extraordinary uh, ability to pave new ways was coming from those uh, startups. So you see, that, that's the reason why I am profoundly optimistic. As you could see, I am reasonably convinced that we will get out of this stagnation, the, 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 the famous secular stagnation was also very fashionable, seems to me not structural, but conjunctural. It's not secular. It was, of course, over several cycles. In that sense, you can qualify it of secular, but it's not eternal. And uh, we will get out of that situation. And it seems to me that markets also know that. Uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, I would say, investors and savers and market participants know that. That being said, at the same time, uh, we have to be very cautious and prudent. I was reading again the work that has been done by uh, CFA uh, at, uh, on, on good advices and good questions at the end of the work. And I have to say, I share very much uh, what, what has been analyzed uh, and said. And, uh, I think the questions are good ones. Excellent. Well, speaking of good questions, uh, we, we have some excellent questions that some of the members of the audience have posed. I've woven some of them into the questions that I've asked you already, but there's one theme that keeps coming up again and again, and that's about asset price inflation. One person asking if we are measuring inflation correctly, if we are not appreciating fully uh, the role of asset price inflation. Another person asking about the connection of that between asset price inflation and social stability and whether or not that can be an accelerant to increasing inequalities, not just at the national level, but just think about Europe for a moment uh, and the inequalities that exist between member states in Europe. I know it's a huge subject, uh, but could you give us our thoughts um, particularly about the role of asset price inflation uh, and what it what it may mean for important trends going forward. Well, f first of all, uh, let me uh, say that uh, I share the view uh, that are uh, the views of all central bankers, namely that they cannot incorporate in their measure of inflation, asset inflation, as uh, inflation, for many reasons. One being that then be responsible for the level of the assets and they don't want uh, and in a market economy you have of course to have the appropriate ups and downs ups and downs and uh, the uh, all the phenomenon that is the uh, i would say price uh, research on the market uh, you should not let the central banks be responsible for that so that's for one a very simple uh, remark I put it aside. That does not mean that uh, central banks should not look very carefully at the consequences of what's happening in the asset market, various asset classes market, credit market that are fueling uh, the uh, asset, uh, impossible assets all have to be absolutely symmetric there. So uh, even before the pandemic, I thought myself that uh, large classes of assets were probably overvalued in comparison with what we had observed in the past, price earning ratios and so forth and so forth, depending on the methodology, but all taken into account. And that was explainable because we, the central banks uh, on both sides of the Atlantic had to combat 
the materialization of the deflationary risk. So they were very accommodating, and that has consequences in, in the market, including, of course, overvaluation. Normally, and I, I am profoundly convinced of that, we should utilize much more actively the overall macro prudentials. So when you clearly see that there are consequences of your accommodation that are, of course, uh, uh, going too far, going to uh, too, uh, dramatically, uh, I would say, pushing up some asset classes, then you should, I already mentioned that en passant when I was saying we have done a lot on the banks, potentials, a lot remains to be done on the non-banks. But that is different now. I am addressing the issue of the systemic, uh, I would say, prudentials. The prudential that would calm a situation which is not going in the right direction. There is a consensus now at a global level to consider that we should be much more active. I take it that we are not sufficiently active at the present moment, and that a lot has to be done to give more clout to these so-called macro prudentials. And uh, what I say is valid, in my opinion, on both sides of the Atlantic and certainly also uh, uh, in Japan, in, in all the advanced economy. Uh, now, uh, of course, you could say uh, the, the combination of very low interest rates and uh, asset valuation are very unjust and creates a lot of injustice. And that is part of your question, if I understand well. Mm. Uh, I have to say it's, it's always more complicated. When we had a high level of interest rates, there was the same criticism, namely because you have high level interest rates, you're giving a lot of money to the savers and uh, the capitalists and those who have money and so forth, and it is unjust. I mean, <laughs> whatever you do when you are a central bank, uh, you. You, one can say uh, there is something which is, uh, of course, in both cases, you can say, but I am protecting the value of money and inflation is dramatic for the most vulnerable, for the poorest part of our population. So we are working for the poor. And I, I said that myself, of course, because I trust it that uh, when you have inflation, those who cannot protect themselves against inflation are the most vulnerable, of course. And on the other hand, when you have uh, uh, interest rates at zero and you have some consequences in asset valuation, of course you can do, but where is the counterfactual? Would you prefer the economy to collapse? Would you prefer the deflationary forces to expand? And uh, is depression a better solution for the most vulnerable and so forth? So you see, in all cases, uh, you can, there are several uh, ways of looking at it. My, my bottom line is the following. It is mainly a political and social problem. So the political sphere has to be fully aware of where it is. And when we compare what is done on both sides of the Atlantic, we see to which extent, of course, the, the political sphere can or not change the situation. As regards the banks, they have to do all what they can to be sure for the most vulnerable and for the, the poorest. And of course, they have to avoid anomalies in, as I said already, offset what could be negative in terms of asset valuation. I mean, negative, I mean abnormal overvaluation uh, by uh, utilizing or calling others to utilize fully the uh, macro prudential. We're running out of time. I want to ask one last question, and it goes to, uh, to, to, to one of the themes that's been going throughout so many of your comments, and it's on the, the accumulation of leverage, uh, the extremely high debt levels we see both in the private sector, co corporates, as well as, as in uh, governments. And the question that one of the audience members has asked is, what kind of path do you see for, for deleveraging? This is net, and how, and I would just add to that, and how do you square that with some of the more optimistic views that you have about the future economic conjuncture 
given how painful we know that deleveraging processes can be? Yes, a very, very good question indeed. Uh, uh, you, you have, uh, you have uh, not, not very much, uh, I would say, uh, solution. Uh, some are saying inflation will do the job. So let inflation gallop and uh, progressively the debt outstanding will be swallowed by inflation and you, you will. But I know what galloping inflation means for our economies, for our societies, and I already elaborated on the, the I would say, most vulnerable uh, being uh, hurt by hyperinflation. Another solution would be generalized, uh, I would say, default. So you, you don't pay back. It's as simple as that. And uh, uh, we are in a situation where uh, the debt outstanding is digested simply by uh, creditors uh, losing their money. Again, I think that I have seen what it means, such situation of crisis. Uh, in Latin America, I was in my past uh, uh, responsibilities, uh, president of the Paris Club. So I could see what it means to have to cope with a drama of that kind. Greece is not far away from us mm -hmm. and we could see what it meant uh, to have a problem of that kind. I mean, a default and, and uh, so it's, it's really dramatic and we cannot speak, uh, I would say, lightly of, of those drama. So the, the right solution seems to be to, I would say, after the pandemic, when we have to digest the previous situation, as I said, and the hump associated with the pandemic, I'm speaking mainly of governments there, of course. And then you will have to behave on the basis, I hope, of an economy which would be more dynamic, but that depends also on your structural reforms, that depends also on yourself, of course, on your society, on the governments, on the parliament. But all taken into account, uh, what would count, in my opinion, I'm speaking under the, your control, because you know better, you, you are advising the decision, you are taking the decisions. But if you see that uh, countries concerned have an outstanding debt that is diminishing year after year as a percentage of GDP, even if the starting point is high in absolute magnitude, but if it diminishes year after year, then you, you can convince investors, savers, market participants that you are eligible to continue Good, uh, appropriate good management of your uh, spendings, appropriate good management of economy and society. But it, it is a right working assumption in my eyes. And I'm not speaking, of course, uh, for us, the least developed uh, in any case. And I call for them to be helped today, of course, as the IMF is recommending. I am in favor of a very large allocation of SDR. I participated in a work which was done by the G30 uh, a private group calling for, uh, for uh, being very bold in terms of uh, avoiding a drama uh, in these uh, countries and societies. And I already mentioned the fact that we in the advanced economy are in some kind of uh, nice cluster of uh, economies that have credibility, but uh, there are other economies and societies that are in a very bad shape today and we should not forget them. I think that's a very good place to leave this. Jean-Claude Trichet, it's been an absolute delight, a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for your time on behalf of CFA France and everyone attending. And thank you to, to everyone in the audience to, uh, for, for coming to this event this evening. We will have a replay that's available on the CFA France a YouTube channel that will be coming along in the coming days. Also with a post-event survey to fill out, please do give us feedback on these events. We take it seriously. It helps us improve events 
for the future. And for those who are members of the French Society, if you're interested in the conversation that you heard tonight, we are always interested in having volunteers join our committee uh, related to this subject in particular, the Macroeconomic Committee. You heard from Jean-Philippe, you have myself, you also have Tristan Perrier from Amundi. So please get in touch with us if you would like to join as a volunteer. But for now, uh, we will leave it there. Have a great evening, everyone. Have a wonderful 2021, hopefully a bit calmer than 2020 was. And uh, thank you for coming and please come to another event. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye, Sarah. It was a real pleasure to be with you, Sarah. And, oh, a pleasure. And it was all mine. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye -bye. And to you. Bye-bye.